welcome again to Professor Richard Fortin. Thank you very much for coming, accepting our invitation. I'd like to acknowledge the many people here, uh, but I want to, and I, I will make a mistake by missing some people who come from far, but I do want to acknowledge the presence a minute ago. Well, her purse is here. Okay. So, will you, Professor Glick, tell? Uh, okay, great. Professor Rick Sakarmi, president of St. Gordon University, who has come, and I'm, I'll say hello to her again when she walks in. Um, Professor Ben Horn is here, I think, somewhere from Ikhilo, uh, and others have come from afar, and I'm sorry if I miss other distinguished guests who have come from afar. Um, I also welcome Dana Wiener, who just walked in, and who's, uh, I can't say anything? Okay. She is uh, now the new Director of Nutrition at Shiva Medical Center, and I missed the goodbye party for her, and I see she has a flower bouquet, so good luck with that. Um, we are here at what I would call an intellectual debate in the British tradition of debating. So this is not the Knesset. This is not the British Parliament. By intellectual academic debate, I think what I'm trying to say, and Professor Glick will clarify in a minute when I introduce the moderator, Professor Glick, and the debaters, is that we have a resolution, and the uh, one, one of the contestants will be pro, one of the contestants will be con the resolution, but that does not necessarily reflect their actual opinion about the resolution. In other words, they are being, they are contestants on, you're going to, I'm taking away all your, I'm stealing your thunder, I'm sorry. Okay, so that's what we, give a joke, okay. So, um, so I, that has to, I think that is very clear. Because this is an academic intellectual debate, uh, it is closed. It's not open to the press. I respectfully would ask, I've seen all members of the press, but we have asked members of the press not to attend because tomorrow, because we're going to be giving a grand round, so that's an open event. Um, so I, I don't think anyone has to respectfully leave, okay, because I don't see anyone from the press. Um, I would also like to say the following before introducing the participants. The resolution, um, um, either Professor Glick or I or both will read the resolution. We are mindful, very mindful of the fact the resolution deals directly with an issue related to Professor Horton. Even though his name doesn't appear in the resolution, the name of the journal, he is the editor in chief, and doesn't appear in the resolution, we are mindful of the fact that it deals with an issue. And are grateful to Professor Horton. One, for accepting the invitation. And secondly, this resolution and the debate was discussed with him in advance. And he has, I think, shown uh, a tremendous amount of courage and grace in agreeing to be present at a debate with this resolution, which I'm going to read. Publications which promote political agendas have no place in scientific and medical journalism, and academics should refrain from publishing in such journals. And that's the resolution. Professor Horton is aware of it and has agreed to uh, be present when we're debating. Because this is a real issue that people do have opinions about and are thinking about, right? So, but we're going to uh, treat it in a strictly academic manner. So I think those are my words of um, general introduction. In uh, more specifically, uh, the format I think Professor Glick will will speak about. There will be opportunities for, at the end, for some uh, audience uh, comments, uh, including from Professor Horton, starting with Professor Horton, actually. Uh, I would like to first thank uh, all of the participants, all of you for coming, participants. The moderator, Professor Shimon Glick, needs no introduction, but I will introduce him very briefly anyway, if that's all right with you, Shimon. Um, he is an ND graduate of Downstate, trained in medicine and endocrinology, Maimonides, Yale, Mount Sinai. He was in the laboratory of Burson and Yalo. Okay. Uh, everyone knows who they were. You know, 
Nobel laureate, Yalo, I think, person uh, did the live to, to receive a Nobel Prize. Here's Professor Carmi. Thank you. I already acknowledged you, uh, Ruth um, Head of medical services at hospitals in New York, was a professor of medicine and chair of medicine, and dean at Ben Gurion. Um, and uh, he's received numerous, numerous awards. For over a decade, he served as ombudsperson for, the, for Israel. It's a very, very difficult task, as you can imagine, and therefore very appropriate for to, to be a moderator uh, for Israel's National Health Service. He's a member of the uh, ASCI, for those of you, Institute of Medicine, all these very uh, important learned societies that uh, US academics and, and worldwide academics recognize. Uh, he's a professor emeritus at BGU. His wife is here as well. We welcome her. Um, uh, Brenda, right? Rubenstein. And he's also, they are proud of the fact that they have six children, 46 grandchildren, and 50 great grandchildren. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, so thank you very much, Professor Glick. Um, you may want to come up and just take center stage for a minute while I introduce the two debate contestants. I'm going to be a little more brief, if that's all right. Um, as far as Professor Horton, you know, I'll just say, of course, I'm, he'll get a full introduction tomorrow. Um, he's editor-in-chief of The Lancet. I think everyone knows that and has a very distinguished background. But if you do justice, we'll do a full introduction tomorrow. Um, the pro, so I don't even know who's pro and who's con, but uh, let me just see. Pro is, um, uh, we'll start with Mark Clarfield. So, uh, Mark Clarkfield, uh, I'll do the brief version, uh, Mark. Um, a, a graduate, we were both alumni of the University of Toronto, uh, where he received his MD degree, FRCP uh, as well, at the Royal College of, uh, of Physicians in 1982, uh, a specialist in geriatrics, uh, professor of medicine and chief of geriatrics and assistant dean uh, at McGill for many years, until 1992, and where he still maintains an adjunct professorship, uh, moved to Israel in 1992, headed the Division of Geriatrics at the Ministry of Health of the State of Israel, uh, is a professor of medicine and uh, director of the International School at Ben Gurion University, uh, at Dean, uh, from 2009 uh, to the present time. I should also just say that Visit of Professor Horton is, uh, of course, I should say, Professor BR will probably be coming in. Okay, obviously the invitation was extended by Professor BR and myself as the endorsement of the Ministry of Health and uh, Professor Shalev, the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine. I forgot to mention that. Okay. So um, one other point about Professor Clarkfield, sorry, I'm a little disorganized, uh, is that among his many other accomplishments and honors. He enjoys some hobbies, including performing folk music with his band, the Unstrung Heroes. And so we heard a little bit of that yesterday. Um, and I believe that you were pro, so that means uh, Professor Rob Strauss is con, right? So, uh, very briefly, I have a long and short version. And to the short version, Professor Strauss is a clinical and research psychiatrist, currently serving as Deputy Hospital Director of the Barry Akot Nesion Medical Health Center, Director of Ambulatory Services of that center. He's a professor, full professor of psychiatry at Sackler Tel Aviv University. Uh, he has authored over 140 peer-reviewed manuscripts on subjects such as psychopharmacology, genetics, neuroimaging, psych psychiatric epidemiology, post-traumatic stress syndrome, and medical ethics. And we're very pleased that you agreed to come and ask you. Ne neither of the contestants have compared notes with each other, if, right? So that's important as far as intellectual debate. And uh, <coughs> Thank you, Carl. Uh, first, let me thank the organizers of the visit, uh, of Professor Horton, and also for inviting me to moderate uh, this morning's debate. Uh, since, as you said, you basically took away everything I was going to say in the introduction, I have to tell you a little bit of a joke, which fits perfectly, sort of a setup. 
there, were, there was uh, this competition for a job as minister in some church, or rabbi, I think, or something. There were two candidates who came, and they were put in adjoining hotel rooms. They, they both had to deliver a sermon. And one fellow had a, this great sermon prepared. He was rehearsing it, rehearsing it over and over again. The other fellow had nothing prepared, but he overheard his first guy's sermon. He wrote it down. And then, as luck would have it, when they came to the morning, they called on the second guy first. And he delivered his first guy's sermon. <laughs> now, what would you do if you, if you had this thing stolen from you? Well, he didn't lose his cool, like the horror too. People there. He said, well, you know, gentlemen and ladies, I never heard this guy sermon before, but I'll tell you how smart I am. I'll be able to repeat it word for word. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what I say to Carl. Uh, we have a very important, relevant, and sensitive subject to discuss this morning. And I think it's great that we're doing this in a, in a spirited, respectful, and academic discussion. Let me tell you about the procedures for this morning's debate. We will not follow the usual Israeli guidelines for debate, which include shouting, interruptions, and simultaneous speaking. We won't? I'm sorry I didn't warn you about this. I prepared myself. Uh, instead, we'll follow modifications of some of the great British institutions, Oxford and Cambridge. And, however, we will not have a vote at the end. In Oxford, they have a vote of, by the public at the end. We will not do that instead. Uh, we've selected also two professionals who both come originally from Great Britain's uh, international Commonwealth. Commonwealth, Canada and South Africa. But also, we keep this in all the families. <laughs> uh, each speaker will get 20 minutes for his initial presentation. Ten minutes for uh, for rebuttal, and then there'll be an audience participation for about 15 minutes, which will people will be able to ask questions, not necessarily make addresses. I will be very strict in terms of enforcing the rules. And if you turn around, you will see another enforcer that will be used in case, <laughs> in case anybody violates the rules over on the Okay, so we'll be warned before we start out. Okay, so without further ado, I will reread the resolution as it was put together. And by the way, I'll, I'll re-emphasize that these two gentlemen uh, do not necessarily believe in what they're going to say. <laughs> they're, 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 they're given random assignments, okay? So if any of you have any great arguments about it, don't take it personally to any one of these people. They probably may be actually thinking the opposite of what they're saying, which is a very interesting ability to do, to argue effectively on something you don't believe in. Uh, the, the resolution to be debated, and I'll repeat it again, publications which promote political agendas have no place in scientific and medical journalism, and academics should refrain from publishing in such journals. Mr. Parker, please. I don't want to give you an advantage of journals, so I'm taking up my time. <laughs> Okay, so good morning. Shalom. Salam alaikum. Thank you very much to Rambam for organizing this. She will not start me until I have a 15 minute introduction, then it's all right. <laughs> I, just want to thank, I want to thank everyone. I don't want to take you to take my time. Only in Israel can you have some of your best friends here, the president of your own university, one of your sons, the mother of one of your of one of your other sons, friends. Residents and old friends of my wife and all kinds of other. This is a very special place, and I'm very grateful to all of you for all of the reasons. Okay, the clock can start, Professor Glenn. I won't read the resolution, it's just been read, uh, read for you. I've been asked to speak in favor of this resolution overall in order to support it. I'm going to make two arguments. First, indeed, a medical journal should stick primarily to medical issues. 
as that is its expertise, the expertise of its editors, its peer reviewers, and above all, the interest and expertise of its readers. Secondly, when a journal does deal with medical issues which touch on political aspects, say, for example, the relative size of the health budget versus the education budget, this journal must do so in a fair, disinterested, unbiased manner and must scrupulously avoid any possibility of a conflict of interest. I will return to these terms, fair, disinterested, unbiased, conflict of interest. A journal which breaks these rules, or is even suspected of doing so, and I'll come back to this concept as well, will suffer a serious and well-deserved blow to its credibility. I need not remind all of us that in academia, the only currency we really have is our intellectual credibility. Two related questions. What's the difference between a medical journal and one which deals with politics? And the second question, what is the harm of cross-dressing? What would it matter if a political journal talked medicine or a medical journal talked politics? I'll start with a couple of clinical examples. I'm in the Rumbon Hospital, which I'm very impressed with. I haven't been here in 30 years. For example, should we screen for lung cancer in smokers? Clinical question. Secondly, in my own field and that of Dr. Velats, Professor Kolotsky, geriatrics, should we use the anti-dementia drug, the nepazone, or the stigma in the treatment of Alzheimer's? <laughs> Two clinical examples. Let's play a mind experiment and submit an article on either or both of these to, let's think for a minute, let's send this article to foreign affairs. Let's submit this article to the International Political Science Review. What would happen? my esteemed colleague, what would happen? They would refuse this article. The editor would send these manuscripts back post-haste with a note, a polite note, I hope, saying that the authors must have erred and they really meant to send this to a medical journal. And why would the editor take this step? Well, clearly because neither the journal's editors nor its peer reviewers have the expertise to judge the, the contents of this article. Alternatively, let's think of a purely political question, which interests me deeply and probably everyone in this room. Let me think for a minute, what might that be? What might that be? Okay, clearly, any lasting solution to the hundred-year-old conflict that we're in the midst of would be beneficial, especially to the health, and I use the word health in the, the widest Manfred Greenoy WHO sense of the word, health. Wouldn't it be good for the welfare and health of both peoples not to speak of the economy, the culture, the environment, and a host of other benefits to our little conflicted area in this dusty part of the Middle East. My, my submission will be titled to, this, to a journal, The Two-State Solution is the Only Way to End the Israel-Palestinian Conflict, an evidence-based approach. A personal side coming up for all, I do believe that. Everything else you can assert, you can decide if I can do or not. I would hardly think, however, of sending this article to JAMA, or to The Lancet, or even to the Israel Medical Association Journal. Appropriately, all of the editors would reject such a submission. Let's think up another issue of great relevance to humanity, including health. Let's think, let's think, yes, global warming. Global warming. All of us, except the card-carrying members of the Flat Earth Society, would agree that global warming is a true danger, not just on the medical side, but to the very existence of our species. What could be more relevant to health than the issue of global warming? Another thought experiment, let's think of a study examining the comparative cost to society of wind, solar power, hydro, coal, natural gas, nuclear energy. Let's look at that. And you know what, voila, there has been such a study recently published. Charles Frank in the Brookings Institution recently published such a piece. I read about it in The Economist. And this study found, counterintuitively, at least to me, that wind and solar power are the most expensive forms of energy. Even if you take into account their carbon footprint or the savings thereof. In fact, they found that natural gas was the cheapest. To remind, we're talking about two issues. First, quote, I'm quoting myself, no one ever else, no one else does. A medical journal should stick to medical issues, as that is its expertise, as that of its editors, peer reviewers, and above all its readers. Why shouldn't Dr. Frank submit this study to a medical journal? Isn't global warming a health issue? The answer, of course, would be no. 
because we do not have the technical expertise or the education to deal with this issue professionally. As educated citizens reading The Economist, we can have an opinion about it. But as experts in the field of energy, I would reckon that no one in this room, unless we have an engineer, well, we, you have engineers here, so there may be the occasional person, but most of us could. My second point that I made about relating to expectations and requirements when dealing with issues that border medicine and politics. Quote, quoting myself again, a journal must do so in a fair, disinterested, and unbiased manner and scrupulously avoid any potential for conflict of interest. To address the second question, let's modify this thought experiment a little bit and have Dr. Frank's findings support coal mining as the cheapest form of energy. That would make you think. Make it even better, the cheapest and cleanest. What if we later discovered that Dr. Frank had been a long-standing advocate for the coal mining industry? What if Dr. Frank had clearly hidden his connections, or perhaps better phrased, his friendliness to this industry? Even worse, what if the editor had been aware of these conflicts, but because of her, in my world, you know, of those who know my wife, I have to talk about all important, my president, all important people are the female gender. What if, because of her personal opinions, perhaps she grew up in Wales, or West Virginia, or is now living in the state of Wyoming, where the biggest coal mines of the world exist? She'd forged ahead and arranged a fast-track publication for this article. And what if she allowed it to be published without any counter-arguments, as in a critical editorial or a face-to-face -face counterpoint? Of course, the editor could then fall back on the kind of wishy-washy excuse that she had later on allowed a few letters to the editor, those that were against Dr. Frank's hypothesis, and of course, a few that were in favor of it. That would surely make you think, that's Bob. And what if under the guise of the issue's relevance to public health, such a paper supported coal mining as the cheapest and healthiest form of energy production? And this were published in a medical journal. This would surely make one think and make us wonder about the editor's intentions. Let's now leave such a purely non-medical issue and move to one where med medicine and politics intersect and interact, and where medical expertise would indeed be relevant to the question at hand. But before we do a summary statement, medical journals should stick primarily, not absolutely, primarily, to their expertise and to the subjects that readers expect them to address. Okay, let's think of another example of where medicine and politics intersect. Any ideas? Oh, something right here. Big Pharma, the drug companies. That's legitimate risk for a medical journal. And this will allow me to focus a bit more on the second subject I promised to do, the absolute need for fairness and the avoidance of even potential conflicts of interest. I addressed it earlier, but this will make it even sharper. Another thought experiment. Let's argue that overall, Big Pharma, drug companies, does society more good than harm when it markets the Me Too drugs. Add an OH, add a CH, you've got a new drug. And if an American medical journal were to tackle this complex issue, but consistently only publish one side, let's say that of Big Pharma, and say that the authors of such a contribution to the field forgot to declare a relevant conflict of interest, such as honorary or speaker's fees from the pharmaceutical industry, what would you think? Furthermore, what if it became clear that the editor, the Yankee editor of this American medical journal were a card-carrying member of the Tea Party? The Tea Party or even a fellow traveler. When this all came out, what could, would, and should the editor of such a medical journal do? Well, there's only two options. One, since we all know that prevention is better than cure, the journal should have taken great care never to have gotten into this situation in the first place. But, as Alexander Pope, the great English poet, said in the 17th century, to err is human, to forgive divine. People make mistakes, things happen thrust and parry and the busyness of everyday life, all of us make mistakes. My wife would be the first to agree that I occasionally make mistakes. When they do, the scrupulous editor, being a well-educated gentlewoman, will of course swiftly apologize. Not only will she say, I'm sorry I erred, but even more importantly, she will make some serious amends. However, if she refused to do so, one might well question either her good judgment or wonder about her basic sense of fair play, or even more seriously, be worried about both. My second summary statement, when medical journals 
do touch on political aspects of medicine, of which there are many, they must do so with the utmost care and fairly and judiciously. Now, I'd like to return to a purely political issue and ask what the role of the medical review might be. Let's occupy ourselves with a few things in the news. One, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Two, China's long-standing invasion and subsequent occupation, occupation of Tibet and the long-standing cultural repression of its people. The UK has been in the news, and our guest is from the UK, and we've had a chance to talk about this a little bit, especially the recent referendum over Scottish independence. Freedom, Scotland, that would be my view. <laughs> What about the United Kingdom's 400-year occupation of Catholic Northern Ireland, some would call it Ulster, by Scottish Protestant settlers? Or finally, very close to us, and unfortunately a terrible, terrible situation, the civil war in Syria. Let's pick the Ukrainian issue, as time does not allow me to go into any of these other <coughs> conflicts. What would a reputable medical journal have to say about this terrible conflict, which has killed thousands to date and shows no signs of abating? Of course, we all know that war is not good for people. So simply saying such a thing would be facile and not helpful. Again, I think we also might be a tad surprised were we to see a letter condemning Ukrainians in general and Ukrainian doctors in particular by a group of Russian medical professionals masquerading as being concerned for the poor treatment of Russian speakers within the Ukraine. We'd be very surprised to see such a letter. Again, we might again wonder with some justice about the editor's judgment or sense of intellectual fair play. Of course, this is a moot point. I don't even know why I bring it up. Looking at journals around the world, and I did before this debate, CMAJ, JAMA, New England Journal, lots of journals, I could not find any such letters. I have now, I'm certain, clearly established that a respectable medical journal should not promote a specific political agenda. This, as opposed to dealing fairly, I repeat, with the political aspects of relevant medical issues, to which it should devote some scarce resources. However, when a journal is seen to flout these rules, what should academics of goodwill to do? This comes back to our resolution. First, taking into account uh, um, the origin of the word boycott, which is a, was an Irish kernel, and I thought you, Professor Griff, were going to give us a bit of a history lesson, uh, I would not. I repeat, I would not call for a formal boycott of such a publication. This would go against all of the rules and spirit of academic freedom. I would not call for a boycott against that journal. You might be surprised by my next statement, nor would I call for a formal, formal campaign to oust the editor of such a journal which flouted these rules of objectivity, fair play, proper declaration of conflict of interest of both authors and editors. I would not. Rather, this is the publisher's job. He or she might be impressed by legitimate complaints by readers and customers or other commentators protesting a particular editor's practices. In the end, not dealing with episodes of editorial malpractice will only be detrimental to that journal's academic reputation. In the end, this is its only true currency, since, of course, none of us in this room care about money, power, prestige. Right? None of us care. Interesting. I find that there are rules and guidelines. Whenever one is in doubt, check the literature. There are rules and guidelines for this, clearly spelled out for such situations. And these can be found in statements of the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, to which many top-notch journals belong. For example, New England Journal, JAMA, Canadian Medical Association, The Lancet, and if I'm not mistaken, 12 others. For example, among other statements, we can find the following, quote, Public trust in the scientific process and credibility of published articles depend in part on how transparently conflicts of interest are handled during the planning, implementation, writing, peer review, editing, I'm emphasizing that word, and publication of scientific work. The statement continues, I quote, a conflict of interest exists when professional judgment concerning a primary interest, such as the validity of research, may be influenced by a secondary it's important to continue, and I quote, perceptions of conflicts of interest, perceptions, I'm quoting the ICMJE statement, perceptions of conflict of interest are as important as actual conflicts of interest. These guidelines are meant for authors, peer reviewers, and editors. But specifically, with respect to the latter, the guidelines are very, very clear. Quote, 
editors who make decisions about manuscripts should recuse themselves. Let's see if that's not recused. I also didn't know that. Recuse themselves from editorial decisions if they have conflicts of interest or relationships that pose potential conflicts related to articles under consideration. Again, why did I make this little detour? I think the rules are clear enough, and I think a reputable publisher would, of course, do the right thing once it was pointed out to them in a civilized, calm, and proper manner that the editor had transgressed. In academia, there's no place for a formal boycott, even if we're dealing with what we perceive as a bias, be it conscious or even unconscious. So what can the academic do, himself or herself, when faced with a clear example of bias, what they perceive as bias in academic publishing? A lack of fair play and a sloped trade playing field. I can offer four alternatives. One, I would, as alluded to above, try persuasion. There's nothing better than a civilized and open dialogue, which is what I hope we're having today and what we've had so far. This would include letters, submissions, personal meetings, and even lobbying. If the editor were still non-responsive, either figuratively or literally, I would communicate first with the journal's ombudsman, then with its publisher, pointing out the lack of adequate response or redress of uncorrected lapses of the sort we discussed this morning. Three, in the unusual but rare circumstance where these steps did not work, I personally would not submit to that journal, nor would I do any peer review for it. Finally, I would lobby my friends, colleagues, and wives to avoid submitting to that journal, but not to formally boycott. In conclusion, I would like to speak most resoundingly for the resolution, which, to remind you, reads as follows. A medical publication which promotes political agendas has no place in scientific and medical journalism, and academics should refrain from publishing in such journals. End of quote. Serious academics with important scientific contributions should shun but not formally boycott a journal which was seen in their minds to have acted in a biased, one-sided manner, and which distorts its scientific mission, especially if it abuses or is perceived to abuse its mission for purely political and partisan reasons. I would strongly encourage serious medical scientists to submit elsewhere, just as I would recommend to the next Picasso to choose to hang his works only in a gallery which reflected his artistic values. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Glenn, Professor Strauss. Thank you very much for your attention. Now we should hear the other point of view. <laughs> <coughs> what is freedom of academic expression? Without the freedom to obtain, it ceases to exist. Salman Rushdie. Mr. Chairman, so ladies and gentlemen, I'm not here today to extol the virtues of any specific political views, perspective of our function. Nor do I intend to wax lyrical, relentlessly or manipulously, over the merits or demerits of any particular military, particular military campaign, international <coughs> deed, or governmental action. Rather, I will address the issue of freedom of speech in general, and academic freedom and responsibility in particular. Furthermore, I'll clarify the concept of ethical boundary violations within the greater medical profession. In the limited time we have together, I will prove that medical pieces promoting political agendas do in fact have a place in scientific and medical journalism. However, and in fact, perhaps most importantly, I wish to state categorically and unequivocally that regardless of your view on this point, Academics and medical professionals should certainly not shun or refrain from publishing in such journals that publish political pieces. Let us begin by addressing the first issue. Medical professionals are the recipients of respect that is due to them from society by virtue of the unwritten social contract that the community has with doctors. Thus, physicians are allowed to undress patients, incise their bodies, remove organs, and probe the most intimate issues in consultation. This contract is coupled with the duty to relieve pain and suffering to manage disease and disability. It is imperative, however, that physicians maintain the boundaries of this interaction so that patients and society can interact in a safe atmosphere with the physician, completely in sync with this patient and clear of any ulterior concerns that may jeopardize his care. 
any political barrier between the two interferes with the unique interaction owed to the patient. Physicians must refuse to employ their training and professional skills in areas that do not belong, such as torture, as defined in the Tokyo Declaration, interrogation, profiling, natural candidate character, assassination, or anything else unrelated to the purpose for which the doctor underwent medical training. But ladies and gentlemen, and this is an imperative but, physicians can and should be involved in the political process in order to obtain better conditions and resources for their patients, ensuring better education of the community in illness prevention and optimal clinical management, as well as demanding equality of care for all. Druin has referred to such a role as advocacy for and participation in improving the aspects of communities that affect the health of individuals. Several examples of such social, political environment exist, including the celebrated Polish doctors of the early 1900s, similarly during the Nazi era. The doctors had a duty, unfortunately, that very seldom did speak out on this, against the atrocities perpetuated on the mentally ill. The mind boggles at the thought of what may have been had physicians during that era spoken out. Remember, it took close to two years to halt the gas of the mentally ill, all occurring before the Holocaust. And only after a single individual, Bishop von Gallen, spoke out. And Hitler stopped the official process. Remember, he never ordered the process. He allowed doctors to kill their patients. Physicians need to speak out in the context of medical publications on issues that feel to be of profound relevance to public health and suffering and well-being. Another way of understanding this is considering the interface of facts and values. An archaeological or physics journal deals with the facts only. It has to by nature. A medical journal is different, for it deals with well-being, values, virtue, interaction, sociological phenomena, and cultural competence. This is essentially what is important to medicine. This is what is demanded today from a medical journal in order to inject more of an emphasis on virtue in the field. One may consider this in keeping with the postmodernism approach to academia and information, which is predicated on the presumption that not everything is factual, rather all is subjective. Thus the question arises in medicine whether it is in fact possible to separate facts from values. Thomas Kuhn, for one, is clear that one cannot. Even if, it is, even if it is possible to separate, is this what you want in medicine, especially in the context of an international flagship medical journal? It is imperative that a medical journal appeals to virtues and open discussion of issues, even if uncomfortable and confrontational to some. Clearly, facts need to be facts and virtues need to be virtues. This is not a license for free for all. But this is how we develop as discerning doctors, ladies and gentlemen, learning to know the difference. I implore my opposing, my opposing speaker, please don't limit me on it. Mr. Chairman, sir, refraining from publishing in any particular publication weakens the value of values, the values that you cherish. Shunning or boycotting removes values from the field, even if the absence of such rash measures opens the door to vastly different opinions. Dialogue is essential to the field. I ask you, is it in place to, to boycott the Journal of Medical Ethics after publishing about after-birth abortion? No, sir. Rather, it affords me the opportunity to match the non-factual opinion-based argument with the dialogue on virtue and value, which trumps the approach. I succeed in both accounts. I combat their view. I introduce debate on a high level around value of life and physician responsibility. And I relish and bask in the glory of a civilized debate of issues of critical importance to society and medicine. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, is there in fact not a parallel between opposing articles of vastly different opinions existing side by side in a journal and the profound contrast well known to Israeli medicine, where it is not uncommon in emergency rooms and hospital wards to find terrorists and terror victims lying side by side as recipients of the same identical state-of-the-art medical attention and standards so characteristic of Israeli medicine and values? Should we not entertain similar values and ethical discourse in the medical literature? Is the conscience of the doctor medicine that is important? We do this by encouraging dialogue and at times even challenging the status quo in society regarding issues of relevance and importance to public health and policy and well-being. Who would not have wanted able-bodied doctors to speak out against the policy of the German T4 program. No doctor spoke about this in international literature. Actually, some did in the United States, supporting it. On this point, I quote the great American poet and author Ella Wheeler Cox. 
to sin by silence when they should protest makes cowards of men. I remind you that it was the British and the Americans and the Canadians who were at the forefront of the eugenics movement, and not the Germans. However, it was the German doctors who actualized the program of eugenics based on synergistic goals of the medical professions and broader political forces. <laughs> Our history would have looked different had physicians openly protested in the medical literature. Ladies and gentlemen, I therefore want to go above and beyond politics. Medical publications need to address fundamental concepts, including <coughs> issues of conscience and virtue. This even includes at times trying to cultivate a healthy skepticism even towards our own points of view. And that, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is a direct quote from the written words of our very own chairman, Professor Glick, from a paper he wrote 20 years ago. Thus, is an issue more than about me as an individual, me as an Israeli doctor. Einstein once quote, try not to become a man of success, but rather try to become a man of value. Mr. Chairman, so ladies and gentlemen, I'm not asking you to agree with the partisan political rhetoric in a medical journal. I'm not asking you to condone the falsehoods and accuracy of pencils and etc. However, I am asking you to agree that medical professions, professionals have the ethical right and duty to stand up and make an issue of public health where they may feel one exists. If they do, I submit to you that this has to be carried out within the context of a medical infrastructure such as a conference, journal, institution, etc. And not through traditional political structures. To do so would be a boundary violation and considering an egregious infringement of medical ethics and professionalism. Addressing a medical journal, however, with a problem affecting public health is a duty of medical professionals. I implore you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, open your hearts and minds and rid yourself of cognitive dissonance and see the difference. I would, however, agree with Daniel Patrick Moynihan that everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not to his own facts. And in the words of Chesterton, to have a right to do a thing is not the same as the right in doing so. However, as Hubert Humphrey once quipped, the right to be heard does not automatically include the right to be taken seriously. And here lies, and here lies the crunch, ladies and gentlemen. Do not fear taking upon such viewpoints. Do not fear exposing and opposing views of the medical literature, whether they are a political stance or not, for what they are, be that factually, ethically, numerically, statistically, philosophically, etc., incorrect. Samuel Johnson once remarked, Every man has a right to utter what he thinks true, and every other man has a right to knock him down for it. It may be that you, like me, do not want to be associated with such people, but I also don't want to limit their speech in any way, because that's one of the things freedom requires. Even if we allow people to be boorish and uncivilized, that doesn't mean we approve it. Do not make the mistake of thinking that you have to agree with people and their beliefs to defend them from injustice. Take them on at their own game. However, this is very different to that dirty B word, boycott. And this brings me to my second point, ladies and gentlemen, as I lucid upon before. Even if you do not agree with me that medical publications with political content have a place in medical journalism, I wish to prove to you that medical professions should emphatically not shun or refrain from publishing in such journals. Let me explain. With rare exceptions, this, the, the progress of science and scholarship and academic work relies heavily on the free exchange of ideas between researchers. This is axiomatic to the process. A formal statement of this principle even exists for scientists in the International Council of Science, founded in 1931. Let me quote. The principle of, universe, of the universality of science is fundamental to scientific progress. The principle embodies freedom of movement, association, expression, and communication. In pursuing its objectives and respect of the rights and responsibilities of scientists, the International Council of Science actively upholds this principle and in so doing opposes any form of discrimination or academic boycott based on opinions or views or stances of, of another. The open values of science encourage debate and discussion on the way to truth and preclude any form of embargo or sanctions based on the opinion of others. Mr. Chairman, so this cannot be stated any clearer. The principle of universality of science and learning clearly stands in tension with the practice of academic boycotts of individuals or journals. An academic boycott consists in a systematic withholding of normal professional relations from academics as a means to achieving some goals. And now, Mr. Chairman, sir, we, as Israeli academics, have often been the recipients of such policy. And now the proposing speaker is suggesting that we do the same. 
the very respectable professor from, from down south in Beersheba, is this what he's proposing? Do we not hold ourselves up to a higher standard of ethical norms? May I submit to you that shunning or boycotting a medical publication based, based on this publication of relevance to public health, despite the word political content, content would directly conform to the moral impermissibility of academic boycotts. Professional discrimination is inappropriate when it is based on considerations extraneous to ethical norms and criteria for excellence, such as political factors and affront to one's sensitivities. Open dialogue, on the other hand, is demanded, and it is there that there is such an offence, or even outrage, that needs to be confronted and purged. The principle of universality is morally grounded in two forms of consideration. The contribution universality makes to the value of science and learning, and the rights of individual researchers and research institutions, including journals, to be free from inappropriate forms of discrimination. Thus, shunning or boycotting an academic journal based on its publication of literature deemed to be inappropriate, no matter how offensive, will be downright unethical and in direct contravention of the ethical principles of scientific endeavor and professional values of medicine. Advances in science and learning are fundamental human goods. An essential property of this intrinsic good is that it is social and collaborative in nature. It is not simply that the acquisition of knowledge and understanding is facilitated by interaction with others. Rather, that the human goods of learning and knowledge include, as crucial features, their sharing and their transmission, a phenomenon that boycotting comes to obliterate. It is true that at times there are publications which may be accused of plagiarism, falsification of facts, poor science, political boundary violations, etc. However, to take a stance on boycotting every time a publication of such ilk sees the light of day, as the proposer states, will be the heart of heresy and misguided vigor. Boycotts intentionally impede communication and collaboration, and, that's, and thus constitute a barrier to scientific progress and its related goods. Now listen carefully, ladies and gentlemen. Because the justification criteria for boycotts are not set in stone and are necessarily imprecise, any boycott may be cited as a precedent by less principled actors to support other politically motivated and unjustified boycotts. In this context, the endorsement of any boycott may make it more difficult to oppose unjustified and harmful boycotts in future circumstances. Have we as Jews and Israelis not been the victim of such injustice in many such circumstances? May I mention Nazi Germany and contemporary BDS as examples in the academic arena? Furthermore, why is refraining from publishing in any particular journal so problematic in humanistic terms? It is because the effects of any given piece of research are unpredictable in the long term. Therefore, the removal of even the small group of Israeli researchers from collaborative scientific activity in international platforms such as certain prominent medical journals might have a disproportionately harmful effect on progress. Even if scientific progress is only delayed due to boycotting a journal by Israeli academics, theoretically a possibility, such a delay may have serious consequences for welfare. This would be unethical in itself. May I propose, as a scholarly and eminent Rosen and you'd had before, that there are three tests to be used when judging whether the probable welfare contribution of a proposed boycott is sufficient to outweigh the harms and risks, and whether the boycott is likely to be proportionate in value terms. The first condition for a boycott to be justified is that it would have to be likely to succeed in addressing the moral evil to which the boycott is a response. If it did not succeed, the boycott would breach the principle of the universality of science and learning with the costs and risks attendant on that breach for no commensurate benefit. Mr. Chairman, sir, ladies and gentlemen, do you really believe that an academic boycott by Israeli academics of any medical journal, be it the New England Journal of Medicine or the Ugandan Journal of Snow Science, would have any effect? Even if you suggest that such anti-Israeli rhetoric 
clearly masquerading as modern-day anti-Semitism in disguise, and that all Jewish academics around the world should shun the journal. Do you really think that we can muster up all the international cabal of Jewish academics with the support of all the elders of Zion and their protocols, and that this would influence anyone besides ingrained anti-Semitic international Jewish control conspiracies? There's absolutely no evidence that previous academic boycotts have substantially contributed to the termination of grave evils. The academic boycott of my birth country, South Africa, which has sometimes been chided in this context, has been shown to have made little contribution to the end of apartheid, or they, although it may have been partly responsible for what Neville Alexander a few years later called the scholarly backwardness of South Africa today. The second moral argument in favor of a boycott is that it be necessary, and that there is no other course of action that could reasonably be expected to bring about the desired results with few moral costs. If alternative strategies are available to ameliorate the moral evil, such as dialogue and debate, then obviously these should be pursued in preference to a boycott. Boycotting measures are thus norm normally and normally the preserve of state not academic entities or individual scientists. Because the intrinsic and instrumental value of science and learning is great, and the costs of, this, of its disruption are potentially severe, the third moral argument states that shunning or boycott could be justified only if it is an exceptional, exceptional response to a great evil. If boycotts were to be implemented in non-exceptional circumstances, they would paralyze and degrade the entire system of collaborative science and learning. Furthermore, universalizability imposes a moral obligation to engage in an academic boycott in every situation in which the justifying criteria for a boycott are met. Thus, any country with any form of considered injustice needs to be boycotted. This would destroy the whole fabric of academic dialogue and interchange of ideas. An important practical corollary to the suggestion is that it is unjustifiably and ethically <coughs> correct to boycott against evils of lesser gravity, moral gravity, while abstaining from a boycott against actions higher on the scale. Is a medical journal publishing an incendiary political piece more important to boycott than an academic journal of a country planning a nuclear bomb to blow us out of the here and now? Ladies and gentlemen, where do you draw the line? Mr. Chairman, sir, May I therefore submit to you that the academic boycott or shunning of a medical journal fails in all three of these ethical standards. Boycotting locks in the biased article with no commensurate response in the offing. Publications often make errors. They need to stand to be corrected and not boycott. I ask you, is it wise to boycott the New York Times after it published an incorrect article in the Crack Babies? Would you boycott the Times magazine after it heard and falsely accused Eric Sharon May his memory be blessed of planning the Sabra, Sabra and Shatila massacre, even though the magazine was proven wrong in court. It stubbornly refused to retract. Boycotting, however, closes off the possibility of correction and betterment of important sources of knowledge. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, sir, my aim today is not to discuss the merits or demerits of any particular published piece of literature in any medical journal. Rather, my goal is to reaffirm the value of open debate about critical topics that all the politically charged entail profound effects for health around the world. Medical journals need to address issues of value, even if in so doing, challenge the sensibilities of some and fail in the aim of fostering virtue in the field. Attacks on journals for publishing authors' <coughs> concerns on issues of public health and political undertones threatens the integrity and, and independence of all scientific journals that deal with medicine and community health in general, and values and virtue in medicine in the medical field in particular. As John Howard once put, it's too much to expect in an academic setting that we should all agree, but it is not too much to expect discipline and unwavering civility. And may I add, Mr. Chairman, sir, unwavering professionalism and a commitment to profound tolerance and forbearance. I thank you.
beyond my wildest expectations that I know about you now. Fantastic. I kept to the time. And I, th I would suggest take 15 seconds just to think about it before we get to read back. Just look at the whole sink in, I think. And we'll let Professor Crawford get a drink so he can wind up and see if he can make a successful rebuttal and then we'll give Charles Strauss a chance to Ready? Sure. We can do a successful Google bus. Um, first of all, thank you again, and uh, Professor Strauss, I was very impressed with uh, the passion of your argument, some of your examples, but uh, I think the logic was uh, faulty in some cases. First of all, all of us are in, 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 in favor of freedom of speech. I don't think there's any argument about that. I never mentioned anything about it stopping freedom of speech or curtailing it in any way. We all know that there are limits to freedom of speech, and the classic American article, I think, uh, uh, example is the justice, was it Brandeis or whoever it was, who said you can't yell fire in a crowded movie place just for fun. You can't do it. That's freedom of speech. We all know that there's limits to freedom of speech, and I never made any uh, argument against that, so I, I would um, suggest that uh, that argument that you presented is... Uh, not really very helpful. Um, also, it seems to me that you rewrote the resolution. I'd like to repeat the resolution. A medical publication which promotes political agendas has no place in scientific and medical journals, and then academics should refrain from publishing in such journals. I don't see anything in the, in the uh, resolution about boycotting despite the fact that it didn't say anything about boycott, I know that the word boycott is in here, so I addressed it and made it perfectly clear that I was against uh, that, the idea of boycotting. But I do think that it is the right, the second part of the resolution says, and academics should refrain from publishing in such journals. Are you suggesting that I should go look for a journal that I think is acting unfairly and and try and publish in that journal just to kind of support medical journalism? Or do you think that, don't you think that the author, the submitter, has a right to pick the journal he wants to go to and to make value judgments on various levels about um, which journal he'd like to go to? The word shun, I, I sort of, I wondered about using the word shun. Um, um, shunning, avoiding, uh, I, I'll, leave that, I'll, I'll leave that open. Perhaps I'd be interested to know what the audience thinks. But I certainly think it's the right of a, of a professional not to submit to a journal that he or they should, he or they should, he or she, she or she thinks is, uh, I don't want to get in trouble again, she or she thinks is the right way to go. Also, you mentioned Nazi medicine as a kind of classical. Unfortunately, whenever we have an ethical debate, not just in Israel, but in many places, we always go back to our uh, old enemies, the Nazis, because they really are the uh, epitome of evil. And it would be hard to argue that in the good old days of the, uh, the uh, what was it called, the Beobachter, the, you know, the Nazi uh, uh, journal. And I'm, re I'm not saying any of the stuff we're talking about today, uh, the journals we're talking about today, come, come anywhere close to that. No, I'm not using that analogy. But there was, of course, the, the doctors in Nazi, in Nazi Germany had a, had a have a, uh, 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 a, an obligation to fight politically against the uh, Nazi regime. That has nothing to do as, as, as people, not as doctors, not as doctors. They had a role, they had an important thing to fight that regime in every way they could. As doctors, they distorted what they did by joining the Nazi party and politicizing medicine. That's exactly what I'm afraid happens when we do not follow this resolution, not that we all become Nazis, that, we, that medicine becomes politicized and we start having political debates about something that has uh, 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 medical, that, that's a medical question. So would you, I'd like to ask you directly, Professor Strauss, do you really think that an article about global warming that compares coal versus natural gas belongs in the New England Journal of Medicine? Is, is that the place to discuss it? Or, is it a place to discuss global warming as a, as a, as a 
a threat to human health, and therefore we defer to our engineer friends and say, tell us something. We, we have shown you that global warming affects human health in the following ways. And it's a serious, serious problem. It's one of the most serious, I would argue, apart from the asteroid hitting the Earth, which is not without the realm of possibility. Maybe we're not investing enough in asteroids, and maybe I should write something in a medical journal about that, because it could destroy the world. But if you were to, wanted to stop an asteroid from hitting the Earth, if you wanted to argue in a, in a medical journal that an asteroid was, we, we needed asteroid defenses, which we do, you would then not have a, the, the debate in the journal about the best way to knock that asteroid out of the sky. Nor would you have a debate in the medical journal about whether fracking was more expensive or less expensive or polluted water more than other forms. You would, perhaps, not perhaps, you should have a, an article about the effect of fracking on human health, but not whether, not the technical side of fracking versus other methods of taking gas from the, uh, the earth. So I think, interestingly enough, not surprising, since we're both reasonably intelligent people, at least you're very intelligent, I am in violent agreement with much, but not all of what you said. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, sir, with your permission, let's begin with uh, correcting a few fundamental errors of my of the opposing speaker, the eminent professor from down south. First of all, <laughs> regarding the issue of Nazi doctors, that is perhaps the most fundamental, most common error made by international doctors over the over the issue of of, uh, of for example the euthanasia program. The doctors that participated in the euthanasia T4 program were not Nazis. There were 800 psychiatrists in Nazi Germany at the time. From my research, only about four protested it. The vast majority were not members of the Nazi party, but they participated in the program because they thought it was good for the population. And there were not doctors that stood up and said, this is not okay. To just put them down and to, to negate it and just be Nazi doctors is a fundamental misunderstanding of that. Nobody stood out. In fact, there was one professor who wrote about it, and it was Foster Kennedy, who wrote to the American Journal of Medicine, in 19, American Journal of Psychiatry, 1943, that what the Nazis were, were doing, with, and the doctors in particular, uh, uh, euthanizing children were, was okay. He felt that all children over the age of five with, with, with mental retardation should be put to death. But not because of the Nazis, because it wasn't good for the population, because they have no work. Leo Kanner, the father of autism in the same journal, said, no, it's not good to put them to death, because they serve a purpose. They can be a, 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 they can be a, a postman, they can clean the streets, and they give something to their parents to live for. The editor of the American Journal of Psychiatry in 1943 said, no, they're both correct. We shouldn't be like the Germans just do it without legislation. We should kill all children over the age of five. Remember, the leaders of the eugenics movement were in Britain and the United States and Canada. But we should give them a reason to do it. In other words, we should give the parents another reason to live, not just for the children. Doctors did not stand up for what they believed in that thing. And therefore, to say that journals should take an approach that is disinterested, ladies and gentlemen, it could be no further from the truth. Apathy is the last thing that I want from a doctor. It's the last thing I want when I sit on that board when I'm accepting students. That's the last thing that I want. A motivation, apathy towards issues of, of public health, global warning. It's the duty of doctors to respond to issues of public health and an asteroid hitting the earth and how we deal with it and fracking in my backyard in Bay Chemish and what's that going to do to the health of the community. I want to plan accordingly. This is of public health value. We have all been nurtured and, and gleaned much from the annals of medical journals. We cannot shun according to our wounds. I would expect more from our esteemed colleague and opponent from the city of seven wells down south we should be more crazy with a well-known adage from the Talmud, we do not throw stones into a well from which we have drunk. Whenever you may think of a medical journal publishing varied points of view, even if they may offend your individual sensibilities, you have to respect the journal for nine diverse points of view. It appears you failed to, un to un you misunderstand the fundamental difference, and listen carefully because this is the crux of the issue, the fundamental difference between a soapbox and a medical journal. An academic journal 
should and must take positions which are morally obvious and clear, essential and urgent. And they should and must avoid opinions that are partisan, arguable, and moral, ambiguous. Partisan argument, however, is, is, is appropriately worked out on the soapbox, in the speaker's corner, and there are op-ed pages of the newspapers. These are spaces which allow for arguments, banter, wrong and right opinion clashes. They are boxing rooms. I would agree with my esteemed opposing colleague that this should not be the case with a prominent medical journal standard, which is a place where the only statements that ought to be made are ones reflecting scientific and moral truth, not scientifically and morally, morally arguable opinion. However, political agendas in the service of public health, including issues that may be issues of public health in the Russian-Ukrainian conflict or the China-Tibet conflict, or in Scotland. <laughs> One may argue that some medical journals, uh, sometimes they do behave as soapbox, but how do you deal with that? The question is, shunning or boycott, is that the answer? Political conflict of interest. Now that is a major, major point where I would disagree with you. Political conflict of interest, a conflict of interest there's always something with someone's opinion from the other side. Why would it be a conflict of interest because someone is a, me a member of some political organization? Does that not allow me, as a physician, a member of, of the prestigious, noble occupation, to express my opinions on an international platform in a medical journal of something to, to, that I think is of critical importance to the field of medicine, public health, and well-being? Do I have not... Not only should I, I have the duty to speak out against something that I feel is important. But once again, within the context of a medical journal. And if you do not agree with it, well, then I would invoke the words of George Orwell, who once quipped that, in real life, it is always the anvil that breaks the hammer. If you consider some prominent high-impact medical publication as a result of what they publish to be more like soapboxes than journals, then tell them so. Don't block an improprieties by refraining from publishing. Don't flatter the editor or the board with an inevitable attention that he or she will invoke from the rest of the world biased anti-Semitic leaning rhetoric. Stand up for your values and show up the journal by responding in whatever format you can. And if the good standing of the journal suffers for, pu for publishing biased trivia or the impact factor plummets or the, inf uh, the editor's position is in question, then so be it. Therefore, even if not retracted, it doesn't matter, because difference and debate are what improves our respective societies. In the case of the current conflict all over the world that there is, we believe that the medical opinions of medical colleagues on all sides of the issues offer an important opportunity to forge, if not consensus, then better and more precise questions about what is right, what is wrong, and what should be done. Noam Chomsky once commented that Google's was in favor of speech for views he liked, so was Stalin. So my esteemed colleague, if you're really in favor of free speech, then you're in favor of freedom of speech for precisely the views you despise. Otherwise, you're not in favor of free speech. I will end with the profound words of Philip Shaw. The right to free speech and the unrealistic expectation to never be offended, even regarding political ideology, cannot coexist. And once again, thank you. Thank you both again. Wow. Uh, now the floor is open to questions. I think that you, you uh, Carl, you said you offered the prerogative. The prerogative. Uh, I'd love, no. to, love to hear the audience. Okay, okay. Uh, the floor is open to questions, preferably questions, not speeches. Only questions. Only questions. Oh, we'll see. It's up to you. Yes, it's the VR. Oh, yeah. Thank you for coming in. No comments, no questions? Yes, sir. I would like, I would like to have a question, please. Speaking about, yeah, here. Uh, once I asked a friend of mine, a physician, well, he read a book. He said, I read only New England. So, why journals, medical journals, don't have a corner or section that deals with other information 
even political, or I have run, I, I have run in environmental um, uh, issues so that physicians get exposed to other material except for medicine. Well, do you, do you want to address this question, any particular person here? Or? Yeah, I guess. Oh, sorry. Well, I think you brought up a very important point, and uh, I, 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 like to, I like to read books and I like to review books. And I find that my, the, the opportunity to review books for medical journals is shrinking. I used to review books for the New England Journal. I used to review books for JAMA. I do review books for the Canadian Medical Association. I'm embarrassed to say I don't know. Um, Richard, there are book reviews still in the Lancet. I'm, no, I, I'm sorry, I'm embarrassed, I don't know. I'll let you go and check, Mark. <laughs> well, if there aren't, if there are, if there are, good. good. I'm not gonna help out the fact that you don't read the Lancet. <laughs> I, did, I did say I'm embarrassed to say I don't know. I don't read the Lancet. It's your yet. embarrassment, then I won't help you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so your point is, is, is uh, and, uh, recently I received a, I, I wrote to the Canadian Medical Association, for whom I write uh, reviews, and um, they told me they're thinking of closing the section. Now, the fact that the Lancet doesn't ask me to write reviews is probably why I don't know whether they do reviews. <laughs> <laughs> It's very good book reviews, by the way. It's superb. <laughs> I, can, I can test for that. Yes. Yes, Dr. Lundry. Um, we generally ask a question to one of the two protagonists, please. Well, it's a bit of a difficult thing. Who's going to answer it? So I'm going to ask the question anyway. Um, a lot of what Professor Strauss said is uh, that we have to go according to the truth and we have to uh, go according, and modern medicine certainly holds the flag high of evidence-based medicine, looking for truth, that should, certainly plagiarism and things that uh, authors send in that isn't based on pure truth shouldn't be published. Um, and if there is a need or an author who submits to a, uh, one of the journals, uh, something which, according to what Professor Strauss said, is the right of every physician or scientist to submit whatever he feels should be relevant to the journal, based on truth, then surely the journal should allow both sides of the issue to come through as because a soapbox has someone who speaks for and against. A journal should have someone who presents the truth from both sides and leave, and leave the, the reader to decide where the real truth is in that issue. I think that's precisely the crux of the matter. When it comes to virtues and values, what is the truth? I think a lot of this is subjective, and that's what the bears, the physician who's reading the article. And I want that to be in a journal. I don't want the journal just to talk about the facts of, of how many epidemiological statistics of how many people got lung cancer in any particular month in the south and the north. I want to know that a medical student or a doctor is reading a journal and is developing physician character as well. That's also part of the, the, the role of a medical journal today. And that, what's facts, I think when it comes to value and virtue, I think that's what makes to feel beautiful and it's very special. And I want that kind of sophistication to come out from the reader. And therefore a journal should particularly not talk necessarily only about factual versions <coughs> and should encourage dialogue because that is conducive to physician character development which is the role of a medical journal today. Other comments, questions? Yes sir. Uh, I was, I'm not sure, I'm the third person speaking with an accent that you might use. <laughs> I think if we vote now, we're in the majority. Uh, I, and both of, all of us, I think, are accustomed to being exposed to the threats of boycotts in two countries. Uh, 
the uh, question I think that should be raised, and I, I'm not quite sure who is for and against this at the moment because I got a bit confused <laughs> between the arguments. But I, but I think the concern that is being shown, and I mean, uh, as we said yesterday, Professor Horton is in the audience. We're not ignoring his <laughs> presence. And there is an issue, as we say, the so-called elephant in the room. Uh, the, I think the concern is about a focus on that a journal adopts an approach, which is wider, let's say, than the medical community is accustomed to see. And, and, and I see that personally favorably. Public health is, is, is a very wide area, and it depends on politics and whatever. So, and I, I'm, I'm very pleased that medical journals publish much wider articles that, 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 you know, that interface with the other factors that impact on that. But I think when there is a focus on one or two particular issues, and there is a tendency to focus on one side of the issue, uh, it's, it's very divisive, and I'm not sure that it contributes then to the kind of debate that we should have. So that if, in fact, we're seeing it in the journal, then it should be in a forum where we, the journal is actually encouraging healthy debate, trying as best as possible to determine that the facts that people are publishing are correct. And, and, but I don't think that the issue here is whether we should be trying to detect as far as possible how close it is to medicine. Because I think that virtually everything in, in public health today is political. And everything is related to economics and so on and so forth. So I think if we start to try and tease out every time, is this truly related to medicine, I think we're going to lose a lot of what is really related to public health. So the question here is, how do we meet this kind of responsibility of allowing publication of whatever is published, and still allow, Sorry, allow it to be done it's responsibly. An editorial comment. Right. Right. It's a question to put and do <laughs> I think a sophisticated journal will encourage a, a, a forum of, of dialogue like that, but, but done in a fair way. I, I would agree with you that that is conducive to, to, to dialogue, and therefore Optimally positive. My, my, to my esteemed colleague from uh, the Valley of Beit Shemesh, are you fighting crack now? Uh, you keep using the word dialogue. Coming back into the edit, the, the debate. You keep using the word dialogue. Die it means two. So, are you, are you in favor of a unilogue? Are you in favor of a journal, wherever it might be, taking a particular position and not having the other side be presented? Is that? Is that? Do you, do you, do you include that as freedom of speech? I think, I think what you what you the point I made was not that they shouldn't address issues that touch on that they should. should medical journals should address the issues that are relevant, the political issues relevant to health, but they have to do it in a way that is unbiased, that is open, that is that encourages dialogue. My position was not they shouldn't, but it should be done a certain way. Are you guys now, now deviating from the from the pro, from you arguing with each other? Oh, okay, sorry. That's fine. We'll, we'll give you a chance to summarize. Yeah. One more comment from somebody in the audience? Yeah, what? Yeah, somebody yeah, has like time to right yeah. the very end. We're about to... We're yeah. about to we're yeah. What we're going to do is have a number of five minute summary for the two speakers and then my summary. Oh, fine. Well, I'll say something before, may I say something before you do that? Then? Yeah, sure, yeah. please. So now we're going to go. Is that all right? Is that all right? Okay, thank you. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to give a speech, but it's, it's, as you said, I'm the elephant in the room. <laughs> so I do want to say something if I may. Um, the first thing I want to say is, I think holding this debate, um, I thank you for it because I think it's in the highest standards of academic discourse to have a debate like this, and uh, I think it's a great tribute to you for. A, having the courage to invite somebody like me into the situation, and B, holding a debate like this where we can discuss in a serious intellectual way um, different positions about what is, we all agree, um, a difficult area. So the first thing I want to do is to thank you and commend you for, for this debate. But now I'm going to disagree with everything Mark said. Um, so uh, th this, this resolution is in two parts, um, and it's important we separate those. The publication 
um, publications which promote political agendas, part, and the academics should refrain from publishing part. Now, the issue about political agendas, let's just be very clear what these words mean, because it's very easy to lose sight of words. And as an editor, I'm very interested in the meaning of words. Political has a very precise um, meaning. It means relating to the government or public affairs of a country. That's all it means. An agenda means things to be done. So, is medicine unrelated to government action or the affairs of a country, the public affairs of a country? Well, I come from a country, I mean, I'm half English, half Norwegian, but I could, half of me comes from a country which um, is wired into its DNA now, the, the idea of a national health service. Founded in the wake of World War II as an expression of national solidarity towards a very clear objective, which was health equity. And that notion of equity being at the centre of our political discourse, we're having problems with it at the moment, but it is so embedded in the modern notions of Great Britain, our culture, that it's something many of us fight for and defend and believe in, and it's political. It, was, it, it came out of many hundreds of years of struggle, but it's deeply political and can't be separated from the ordinary of what goes on in, 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 a, in an academic medical centre such as this. Should we as doctors or medicine or medical journals not have priorities about what should be done? Or should we just have a long shopping list and say, well, it's up to you in government to decide and we're simply your servants and you make the decisions and we will implement those decisions? Or do we not feel, as health professionals, that we actually should have some stake in that debate and make an argument about what should be done, what the things are to be done? I think if you put those two ideas together, that there are issues in public affairs and government that relate to medicine and that we should have an opinion, it seems to me impossible to say that medical journals, health professionals, should not have a political agenda. Indeed, I would turn it around and say, actually, it would be outrageous, absolutely outrageous, a, a, a dereliction of our responsibility as professionals and journals if we didn't have a political agenda. And I would say one of the great scars across scholarship today in the sciences and the medical sciences, perhaps particularly, is that we failed to embrace a political agenda, to stand up for a set of values that we as a profession believe in and hold <coughs> dear to our hearts. Now, let me, let me turn to the criteria that Marx set out of fair and unbiased. Well, what is fair and unbiased? What is balance? I've been around at the Lancet for a long time, and I've had my controversies to deal with in the past. Let's take MMR, another little controversy that popped up a few years ago, the debate about the safety of measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. The media interpreted fair and unbiased to mean that whenever there was an interview on the radio, you had five minutes for the people who thought the vaccine was safe, and five minutes for the people who thought the vaccine was dangerous. So your definition of fair and unbiased can carry within it hidden harms, which when expressed in the full meaning of unbiased and fair can actually cause huge damage. So let us be very careful about simply embracing those words because sometimes they can be wrong. Indeed, sometimes, sometimes, there will be moments when reasonable people will want to take a judgment and to choose a particular side. The commitment should not be to say always on every issue, on the one hand this and on the other hand that. The commitment should be that if one is going to take sides, 
then one opens one, one's publication up to a full and frank debate after you've taken the side. The great criticism would be that if we published a piece that took a side of, a, of an argument and we then closed our doors to all of our critics, that would be deeply wrong and it's something we would never do. Should we therefore not promote, as Mark said, a political agenda? Well, I've mentioned the NHS already, but there are many other areas in health and medicine where we should most definitely be promoting a political agenda. But each journal will have its own political agenda, and that's deeply good for pluralism in medicine. Our agenda is very much around global health, and we have actively promoted political agendas in relation to international aid, in relation to laws in the way they affect particular communities. For, for example, laws uh, against uh, laws that are homophobic, or laws against drug users, or laws against sex workers, all of which are deeply political, but we have, we have taken a stand on, and we do believe are important to promote. Let me come to the issue of conflict of interest. Conflict of interest has become in Ken Rothman's words, the new McCarthyism of science. It's very easy to label people as a way to excuse not engaging with an argument. Oh, well, this person's taken money from Pfizer or from wherever, therefore, I'm not going to take, pay any attention to his or her opinion. Or this person has a particular point of view because of their bias, therefore, I'm not going to engage with their opinion. We can do better than that as a scholarly community. We can do better than that. If somebody poses an argument, let's engage with that argument. One person's conflict of interest is another person's experience. We once had a policy at the Lancet of not having reviewers, statistical reviewers, who worked within the pharmaceutical industry. And we had one particular statistical reviewer who argued, so you're saying that simply because I work in pharma, I have such a conflict of interest that I can't deliver a scientific opinion. And we had to sit back and say, you're right. That's a really crazy, stupid policy. So be very careful about letting labels get in the way of making good arguments. <coughs> now on the subject of boycott, I think we're playing with words here. The, the resolution was academics should refrain from publishing in such journals. The definition of boycott is withdrawing from relations with an entity as a punishment or protest. We are talking about a boycott, whether we use the word or whether we're not using the word. Many of my friends who work in the Palestinian territory support the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement and ask me if the Lancet will support that. We would never, ever support a boycott. Boycotts are wrong. The right way to engage in any kind of change, whatever one's political agenda, is to open a channel of communication. And only through communication and talking and sharing experience and knowledge can we <coughs> change. So we must resist, we must condemn boycotts in every possible way and see communication as the only way forward. So I agree with both of our speakers when they emphasize the importance of dialogue. And indeed, that's why I'm here. I'm here to listen and to engage in dialogue. And I've only been here just over 24 hours. But I've already learned a great deal. And I believe we can turn this experience into something very positive in the long term. I'm going to end, if I may, with quote, two quotes. The first quote is this. Remaining neutral in the face of injustice is the hallmark of a lack of ethical engagement, typical of docile populations under fascism. The second quote. Health workers should not stand by while injustice leads to the death and injury of civilians in a conflict that could be prevented. Who wrote that? The people who wrote that were actually Jewish health professionals living in South Africa. 
And they wrote that in The Lancet at the end of August this year. And they wrote it as people who, as they said, had witnessed the worst excesses of state brutality under apartheid. When they were living under apartheid, they desperately wanted a forum to express their views about the political regime under which they were living and working. And they did not have an opportunity to express those views. So I would make a plea to you that political agendas are something to be encouraged, supported, and promoted in the very best interests of our patients and populations who we serve. <coughs> And that we should not only not refrain from uh, publishing in journals, but we should engage with journals even more strenuously when we disagree with them. As you have shown by inviting me here this week. Because I promise you that by engaging with those journals, those editors, you will change their minds. You will educate them and show them to take a different path and by that process lead to something better. So I want to thank our two speakers who I think did a brilliant job, thank our chair and thank you for giving me the opportunity to say a few words. Thank you very much. For very vigorous, forceful, and almost convincing presentation of their points of view. It's your call. Uh, uh, I'm reminded of the very strongly. Huh? And who's the guy? <laughs> Mark, I don't mind whatever. I don't I'm mind. I'm going to be arbitrary. It's up to you. I don't mind. Sir, Blake is the moderator. Yeah. Um, sorry, you'll forgive me. Okay. Kipper this week, you'll forgive me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm reminded of the, of, uh, they're both so convincing. I'm reminded of the rabbi and his wife. And, to the, 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 the two people came in front of the rabbi and they both presented their cases and he said, You're right and you're right. And I said, How can you do that? He said, You're right too. So that, that's the sort of thing. Uh, I'm going to take the prerogative, which is, not, which is illegal and in, inappropriate, to give you my opinion of this whole thing. <laughs> that's right. Okay. And uh, I think we live in, we live in, in a uh, era, in, era now where medical schools are asked to have social accountability. Uh, and I, we also uh, live, we have the undisputable data from all over the world that health is not a function merely of provision of medical care. And that the major factor in health of populations and of people is poverty, wars, and that kind of thing. So, uh, Lancet, several years ago, gave a statistic that three hours of military expenditure in the world is enough to wipe out eight infectious diseases that came from the Lancet. He reads a lot. Sorry. What? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay, I quote the Lancet. Uh, so decisions affecting poverty and war are clearly political decisions, but health decisions. So I would agree strongly with Dr. Horton that there is a place for political agendas in general medical journals. I think the Journal of the Left Nostril does, does not necessarily have to take a program. But a, a, a journal like Lancet, New England, JAMA has a role and a duty. I think you expressed that very, very forcefully last night, and I would agree with that. However, politics uh, has ethical standards as well. Uh, there's clean politics and there's dirty politics. So I think justice is a standard in accepting research articles, which are held to a very specific standard. There's also there is also a standard for other for political articles, and there is disagree with uh, you, Dr. Horton, that there is a problem at times of conflicts of interest on the part of writers, uh, and there is a place not to permit factual distortions, invective, and the like. And great care, much more care, has to be exercised uh, in publishing political articles than perhaps uh, research articles. 
And if a scientist has the choice of writing an article and submitting it, I think it's his privilege and his duty to decide in which journal he was going to submit it. And if he feels that a journal violates regularly uh, scientific basis, he won't send an article to a journal that violates scientific research publication. And the same thing if he feels a journal that violates integrity in politics, he has that right and privilege to make that decision. I think I would not to a boycott, but I think that's a decision. And there are plenty of journals around. So if you have a duty as every editor to keep your journal at the highest standard in all respects. I think that's clear. Uh, from my, what I know of the opinion of both debaters today, that they took positions, they both agree with each other that I know. Okay? And I think they, they more or less agree with what I said here today. Uh, I think we've given you a really a very exciting morning and stuff to think about. And I, I'm really grateful for the opportunity and the privilege to stand before you as the moderator and wish you a happy new year, whatever's left of it. <laughs> and thank you all for this privilege. Thank you. On behalf of Rumba on Healthcare Campus, I want to thank everyone for attending. I want to thank Professor Glick and our contestants and all of you for your intelligence and enjoying the show. Do you have a picture of the